All right, my name is Kurt Colmore, and what we're going to discuss today is spare housing issues, specifically assistance animals. And so, as it pertains to fair housing, there are seven protected classes, right? And now, seven federally protected classes, now nine protected classes in Utah. Okay, so you have the seven protect, federally protected classes. Do you guys know what those are? Refresh us. Okay. Yeah. Throw some out there. Race. Race. Religion. Religion. Age. National origin. Age is not. National origin. Well, how about the 55 and above? 55 and above, if anything, speaks to familial status because you can potentially restrict kids in those communities, but, it, but it's not age. If, if somebody wanted to say, I don't rent to anybody under 20, I only rent to people between the ages of 25 and 35, potentially you could do that. Not that it would be a good business practice, but it could. Okay. All right. So race, religion, national origin was said. Familial status, source of income is in Utah. That's Utah, okay. Uh, color, which kind of sounds like race, race and national origin, but it's another one. So race, national origin, color, religion, sex, or gender, familial status, and biggest one. Disability. Disability, Disability is the biggest one. Okay. The biggest one as far as the number of claims. How about mixed gender in the same apartment? Is that Yes. You can't have that or you can't have that. You have to allow that generally. And I know that's a big problem around college campuses yeah. where they try to do <clears throat> men's and women's dorms, but technically under fair housing laws, unless you have a religious exemption like BYU does in BYU approved housing, technically you cannot say this is a women's unit, this is a men's unit. I know it happens, but we're, we're going to skip over that issue today because that's, that's an issue. Okay. So we got the seven protected classes with disability. Disability is what we're going to come back to. But in Utah, you have source of income. And the new one that's about to be in the law is uh, sexual orientation or sexual identity. So in fair housing claims, this is not science. This is just my guess. We do a lot of fair housing defense in Utah. I guess that at least 75, 80% of the claims are all from one protected class, that being disability. And a lot of those claims have to do with what's called a reasonable accommodation. And I'm sure many of you have experienced a reasonable accommodation of requesting an assistance animal, right? You guys had some experience with that? Is assistance animal the same as a companion animal? It is, this is a good question. So, a lot of you guys have heard the term service animal, companion animal, therapy animal. Now, assistance animal. HUD likes us to use the word assistance animal to cover all of them. <clears throat> there are some distinctions, obviously. Um, even though HUD and the Disability Law Center will suggest that there aren't distinctions, there are. Okay, so before we get to that, these forms that, that you've been given are the product of a couple claims that have that are getting resolved with HUD. These have been vetted by HUD. These have been vetted by the Utah Anti-Discrimination Labor Division. And there is, and we're maybe a week or so away from getting their blessing on these forms. So these are going to be as good of forms as you can find anywhere in the nation. I mean, I mean, these have gone through HUD in Denver and HUD in D.C. So there's no forms that are going to be better than these forms. With that said, these forms are not produced by HUD. HUD could change their mind at any point, you know, but these will be blessed by HUD, so this is as good as it gets. Um, so like I said, they like the term assistance animals. So what, let's talk about what the distinction though is. A service animal is like a seeing eye dog or something like that, okay? We have to make this distinction because if the, if the need for the animal is readily apparent or easily apparent, then we need to do less work and create less obstacles for that person to, to get that approved. If somebody comes in and they're clearly blind and clearly need a seeing eye dog, we ask a lot less questions to approve that animal versus somebody who has a quote unquote companion animal. So because a companion animal generally is not readily apparent, we're talking about a mental disability generally, and uh, 
you know, we don't we don't know, so we can ask for a little bit more verification, and that's where these forms will come in handy. Loneliness is that a known disability? That's going to depend on verification from generally a medical professional or somebody else. But I don't know if there's a diagnosis of loneliness, but they might call it depression or something like that. So potentially, yes. The word anxiety seems to be the one that anxiety pops up a lot, and you can be yeah. <laughs> You can be diagnosed with that, yes, I guess. From a midwife? <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, so that's a good question. We'll get to that. Who who has authority to, to give verification? Okay. So, but it's important. If you look at number two, well, first off, if you look at this, these instructions are for instructional purposes only and should not be given to a resident as part of the assistance animal request packet. That seems obvious. But the first time we gave out this instruction sheet that we started publishing this to our clients, within two days the Disability Law Center called us about questions from this instruction sheet. So <laughs> this is for your help in verif verifying the assistance animal. This should not be given to the tenant. With that said, this is part of the packet that HUD is approving. So there's nothing necessarily wrong with this, but this is for your, your instructional purposes and not necessarily for the tenant. Um, if you look at number two, it says these forms are for any assistance animal, which encompasses all the animals we talked about, wherein the need for the animal is not readily apparent, like a seeing eye dog. Service animals where the need is apparent need not use this form, but should still provide the information on the an animal identification form. The, very, the second form here is an animal identification form. You can still request this information from anybody that needs an assistance animal. And this is just basically identifying the animal, making sure we know who, what animal is in there and, and uh, that that is, in fact, the animal that's, that's being approved. So that's OK still to get from even people who have a, an apparent need for the service animal. Are you going to cover this form later? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we'll come back to it as well. If you have a question, feel free to ask it. We'll be jumping okay. back and forth. Um, I notice it has nothing about uh, um, the uh, immunizations or something. No, yeah, immunizations, but no, I was thinking like the city dog tag or the, the chip under its skin. There should be something like that that would apply to the animal, too. Right? Um, not necessarily. We cannot require that they that they have that. It's the city required. Like rabies shot? Are you on the rabies tag? Um, I'm saying the dog tag for that, that they've been licensed to that. That yeah, keys, right. that yeah. keys one on one to the animal. Right? This this says right here that I affirm that the animal is in compliance with all state and local laws concerning animals. If yeah. they affirm that, then then that's up to them at that point. When you could have that dog tag number on here yeah. as one of the identification. I I wouldn't ask for more information than than what's already on here. These. These have been through a lot of vetting, and we used to require more information, and we've pulled some stuff out, as HUD has said, this is overly burdensome. And so that's that's really been the scope of the, the issues with these forms, is that they want to make it as easy as a process and not too onerous on the person requesting it. When it becomes too onerous or we have too many obstacles, that's when HUD or the UALD then sees that this could be potentially discrimination that you're making it you're making it too difficult and making it too too big of an obstacle for them to overcome to get their service animal which is necessary from their point of view and so if there's information if you're requesting information that is not on here I would be very careful as that might be deemed to be overly burdensome in fact I was in a seminar yesterday with the Disability Law Center where there was a request for a companion animal on phone they they do testing, I don't know if you're aware of this, but this was one of their test test calls. And as soon as the companion animal came up, the guy started saying, well, you need to prove that you have a DNA sample, you need to prove this. And that's one of the things that the Disability Law Center, the ULD, harped on saying you can't require that. So I, I, I would strongly advise sticking to the information on here and not requiring more. The fact that they affirm that the animal's in compliance with state and local laws generally going to be enough and if it turns out that it's not and the state or the city takes action and so be it but that's that's at least not you violating potentially violating fair housing laws <clears throat> um, let's 
So it says, back to number two, service animals where the need is apparent do not use this form, but should still wear to read that shape three. You can require the information on the animal and ask that the resident affirm their request for the assistance animal. So if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I need a companion animal, then that is a reasonable accommodation request. However, we still want to get that in writing because one of the key components in a disability claim or a discrimination claim based on disability, particularly in regards to a reasonable accommodation, is whether we properly engage the tenant and, and tried to find a solution. How do we show that we properly engaged it? You gotta document it. And so if they come up and ask you for any reasonable accommodation, you wanna get that in writing. If they're asking for a reasonable accommodation for an assistance animal, we wanna get that in writing. That's what this first form is. Residents request for assistance animal. If for one, whatever reason they are un, un, unable to fill this out, we can fill this out with them for them on their behalf, but then we would want to say, I want to go over this with you, make sure this is this is what, what you're requesting. That one, you're aware that, let's go over this form. First, they affirm that they are handicapped, and we use the word handicapped because that's actually what, what is defined in the act. Okay, so it says, I'm aware of the requirements of the Fair Housing Act and its definitions which include handicapped. Handicapped, means having a physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more of such person's major life activities. Um, having a record of having such an impairment or being regarded as having such an impairment, but such term does not include current illegal use of or addiction to a controlled substance. So pretty much if they have a physical or mental impairment which substantially limits one or more of the person's major life activities. What are major life activities? Walking, sleeping, working, functioning in a house, pretty much anything like that, you know. Yeah. No, and on that note, do do does a doc, do you need a doc? Do you need to get a doctor involved? Do they need to get a doctor involved? We we need some verification, and we're getting to that. Okay. So we can we can request verification, but at first they're going to affirm that yes, I am disabled, and yes, I'm making this request because I'm disabled. Okay. So you that's can the ask what the disability is. Huh? Uh, cannot ask. Oh, no, you cannot <laughs> ask. You do that, right? No, well, you're just giving me a hard time. Yeah, I know. Because it's all smoke and games that are playing with us. Because who's disabled that. nowadays, right? Yeah. Everybody, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, but really, like, how do you, how do you how know? Do you determine who's anybody, disabled? Yeah. Anybody potentially could be disabled. Everybody potentially could be disabled, I'm sure. I could go to the right doctor right now and tell him. They do. And I'm not making light of anything. But of I could go and tell him a bunch of problems and get diagnosed with something potentially, right? Nice. So we need to take these serious that potentially anybody could be disabled. Okay. So, two, qualification. Pursuant to the definition above, I do qualify as having a disability. Impairment. I represent that the requested assistance animal is necessary to provide assistance with my disability. Okay, so once, once we know they're disabled, whatever their request is, and in this case an assistance animal, there has to be a nexus for the need for that animal and the disability, okay? Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of where there was no nexus, but an obvious one, which maybe you'll see, is I have a disability and I need three cats. Why three cats? What are three cats going to do that one cat will not do? And so if they cannot establish that nexus between the second and third cat, those cats are not um, going to be assistance animals. So, so you're right to do that. She's a cat lady and she has no disability. <laughs> so, yeah. now, what about if you say, what does a cat do that a stuffed cat won't do? <laughs> yeah, that's something that we can verify, right? But mm -hmm. so, but if they... But you can't ask what the disability is, but you can ask how this assistance animal Relieves the disability. And we're not going to ask the disabled person. We're, when we verify, that's, that's when we'll ask. But if they're telling us, yes, mm -hmm. I need this for my disability, right. we're going to take them at face value at first until we go to verify. Right. Clearly, if, if there's something strange and out, you know, out of ordinary, there's three cats, okay, mm -hmm. then that should raise a flag in that we need to do maybe a little bit more on the verification. Okay, But at that point, we're not going to just deny it because it's three. It's just it begins to raise a flag. All right. But who's supposed to tell 
what kind of animal should be there. Right. Because I, I, I talked to the doctor and he said, no, I, I don't know, but if she wants dog, that's okay. Yeah. That's kind of like, and I said, is this necessity? Mm, I would say so. Okay. <laughs> So that, so we'll get into this, but that's part of the verification process. We do verification for two reasons. One, to verify this particular request is legitimate, but two, to start training the professionals who are prescribing these animals and so that they understand what it actually means to our industry. So maybe they, they think about, think twice about prescribing these um, because they know that it's going to be verified. and because there is that potential for abuse that we're trying to avoid. You know, if we can get rid of the people who are abusing it, then everybody wants to get rid of the abusers, right? Clearly yeah. people are trying to get assistance animals in or companion animals because they don't want to pay for pet fees or pet deposits and they just want to get their pet in, that, in the home without paying that or maybe get a pet in a home where otherwise pets are not allowed and we have to allow them. Um, and so, we want to get rid of the abuse, which is part of the reason why HUD and UALD has approved these forms is because they realize there is a necessity to do some verification to, to kind of slow the abuse rate down. But, but we'll get to verification in a minute. So, does, does a pet, is any class of pet, like a dog or cat, or if someone says, I have a rat, that's a... Yeah. So is that considered? It could be, yes. Just, we'll get to all this later, but... Yes, I have seen a chicken as a companion animal. Reptile. I've seen boa constrictors. Snake. That's, that's yeah. pigs. Snake. Pigs. Little pigs. I've seen fish. For pig, there's a case a oh. case in New York not too long ago, a pygmy horse. And apparently a pygmy horse is actually really good for like seeing blind people and stuff like that because you train them once and they live to be like 80 or 90. So you only have to train one for one person's lifetime as opposed to multiple. Right. And the pygmy horses apparently are just as trained as dogs and stuff like that. So I don't know. Who picks up the poop? Uh, Who picks up the poop? Same yeah. as dogs. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. What touch, right? The anticipated length of the disability is, this isn't really a trick question, but if they say it's only three months, that should raise a red flag again. Maybe this isn't actually a disability. You know, disabilities are generally for undetermined times or for life. Uh, my primary care physician is Dr. So-and-so, who is this. So the request, I do hereby request that I be able to reside with an assistance animal on the premises below. I certify that this is true. I agree that the only animal I keep for this purpose is listed herein, so they can't sneak in other animals. Um, so why, why do we have an assistance animal? Why do we have this problem? Because with assistance animal, maybe this is obvious to some of you guys, we cannot Allowing an assistance animal is essentially like allowing a wheelchair or something like that. We cannot charge additional deposits. We cannot charge additional rents. We cannot have them sign different agreements other than what we have here. We, uh, we cannot restrict them. Even if we have a no pet policy, you're going to have to allow animals if a, if a verified assistance animal is requested. Okay. So that's the issue, really. I just have a quick question. It's not off the side or anything. What happens if you do have like three roommates at a, a student housing? One comes in and they do need this kind of animal, and another one is definitely allergic. So that's what do we do? We got this issue of competing disabilities at that point, right? Okay. And so oftentimes that's going to be resolved by who was here first. You know? Okay. Um, but in any event, when you have stuff like that. The important part is to engage the tenants who are asking these things and try to first find a reasonable solution. If there's not a reasonable solution, then maybe it means one of them ends up having to move somewhere else or something like that. But, yeah. What about uh, what about someone like wants a boa constrictor, but you know maybe the neighbor or, or another tenant has an infant? I mean, They've been known to people. I'm just kind of thinking. Right. So, you're talking about a boa constrictor. Generally, we're not we're not going to have too big of a safety concern. Generally, because those are normally kept in glass or something like that. They, they pet them, but, yeah, but it they would speak to the reason. 
my, my son had a snake. It wasn't even a ball. It was just a you know, normal garden snake. But it was, it was about this long. And they could get out of anything. I mean, really? they stack books, I mean, textbooks on top of the terrarium. And they could just push it off and get out. Yeah. So, it speaks to the reasonableness of the request, which we need to remember that these are always reasonable accommodation requests. Don't forget that qualifier. It needs to be reasonable. So is it reasonable to have a wolf as a companion animal in a multi-family dwelling? Maybe not, you know. That's a wild breed might be. What about restricted breeds? There are. We, we cannot restrict the breeds of domesticated animals. Um, and I, I don't even know how it would come down if you claimed that a wolf was domesticated, but I think, you know, if somebody wants to bring in a polar bear as a companion animal, that's probably not reasonable, right? But um, pit bulls and stuff like that, we have to approve them. Rottweilers, we have to approve them. If, assuming they, they check out after this process. So I've seen a lot of ads with, like, small dogs allowed. Is it discrimination? No. You, as your own community, or you as your own house, can restrict or can restrict animals altogether. You can decide, I don't let in any Shih Tzus. You can decide, I only let in dogs up to 20 pounds. But if it's a companion animal, you're going to have to allow him whatever. But if you have insurance that won't, um, that won't cover you if you have restricted they will. breeds? They'll still allow it in there because there are lawsuits out there right now against insurance companies for refusing these restricted breeds and your insurance is not going to want to deal with it. They're aware of this now, they're going to let it in. That's exactly what your dad said yesterday at the seminar that I went to. Yes. It, there, there's contention right now in that it's exactly, it's in litigation, he said. Yes. Because uh, yeah. insurance will not cover you if you have a pit bull or something like that. But companion animals, it's a whole different animal, so to speak. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, coming back to page one. So we've given them the request. Now, now that we have a formal request in writing, whether they fill this out or you help them fill this out, now we have an obligation to, to verify this request. So what, is, what can we get for verification? Again, if there's an apparent need, we're probably done. We've got the reasonable accommodation request. We've got the information on the animal. We're going to grant this request. If it's not apparent, we can that they provide documentation from a professional or other qualified person. I'm reading number five. Sorry, let's go back to number four. Give them the verification for the assistance animal form as a guide for the healthcare professional. So, the very last page is, it, is that verification. If the professional does not want to sign it and provide, provide substantially the same information in another format, it must be accepted. Remember to review your policy on who can provide this information. If they come to you with a note from the doctor and it essentially has this information already, don't require them to fill this one out. We already have the information, okay? But here's the information that we can get from them when the need is not apparent. We can get from a medical professional or another qualified person, and we'll go over that in just a second. We can get that first off, they affirm that the person is handicapped and they are aware and have personal knowledge of the handicap or the disability. And then we can ask them that they are essentially prescribing that this companion animal, there is a nexus between the need for this and the disability. If they affirm both of those, we're done. We've got the information we need. We're going to grant a reasonable accommodation request. <coughs> Yes. So he writes the prescription, whatever it's in. Can we say that, okay, you need this companion animal? You need to take it to work with you to be your companion at work too? No. No. <laughs> I mean, if, if there's a need, yeah. you know, for it, it seems like it would yeah, cover we're, all. Well, um, we're not in a position to detail what that, what that prescription actually means. And okay. so. And, and oftentimes companion animals, so we're talking about fair housing laws, right? But once you go out into public spaces, you're dealing with the Americans with Disability Act. Americans with Disability Act does not necessarily allow companion, what we call companion animals, although it does allow service animals. And so 
while we have to accept it, their work very well may be able to restrict those animals. So, so what if you say no? If you say no, then okay. you potentially are looking at a complaint with uh, either a lawsuit, a federal lawsuit, or a complaint with the Utah Anti-Discrimination Labor Division, or a complaint with HUD. If they find that you violated the Fair Housing Act, the fines in a federal lawsuit start at about thirty to fifty thousand dollars. The fines for a first-time offense with the UALD are eleven to thirteen thousand, I believe. What's UALD? UALD is the Utah Anti-Discrimination and Labor Division. They're the they're the they're basically the agency for HUD that monitors and and uh, enforces this stuff in Utah. Although HUD still has jurisdiction, can come in and take that case as well. What? Go ahead. Sorry. You know, saying they need this, the animal. On record of a lot of forged, you know, prescription things, how do you know if the person they handed you is actually? That's correct. That's a good, good question. So we'll go over that. Did you? I called uh, some of those doctors that's been on there mm -hmm. and asked them if you know they were the one that said this person right. anxiety and whatever. And they said yes. And I said, how many times have you treated her? I said, just once. Yeah. So you see what I'm saying? And that, I mean, and that I happened. Go so that. I so go part that. of the reason why we call is for these, is to first off verify that they actually signed this form. Because I wouldn't say a large percentage of them, but there are some out there that are completely forged. And so, no, I didn't even sign this. All right. Or it was signed by their best friend he was a doctor. Psychotherapist, some of those. But that's okay. So who can this form be signed by, or any form? It just has to be somebody who has intimate knowledge, or intimate may not be the right word, who has, who has knowledge of this person's disability and knows that this companion animal treats that disability. So who can that be? Obviously we like medical professionals first, or social workers, or therapists, but can it be a nurse? Yes. Can it be a dentist? I've seen that, yes, potentially. Nurses have the right to prescribe. So we're, this isn't actually a prescription, right? Okay. This is just affirming these two things. So could a nurse do that? Yes, potentially. Um, if, it's, if it is a nurse or a dentist, again, it can raise a flag about, and we can maybe ask some follow-up questions. We'll talk about those in a minute, but who else, who else could it be? Could it be a mom? Yes, it could be. For example, say say the mom knows that he's got a son with autism and knows that this dog has been able to treat this kid's autism. This kid is now 20, 21, looking for his own, own place and, and moving out. And he needs his dog to, to continue to treat his autism. Mom could potentially sign this form. We're gonna, we're gonna have to accept that. Wow, that's why I don't. Yes, it is why I don't. We like to encourage and suggest that it's a medical professional, but just keep in mind, it doesn't have to be. They could, uh, this is crazy. It is. Uh, it's, uh, what yeah, have to go by? fair housing loss. I mean, it's HUD, so this it's is. Yeah, but some, somebody <laughs> makes these rules and these laws, so what, what these people are thinking? The people who make the laws? Yeah. The people who make the laws are, for the most part, well-intentioned, trying to help people with disabilities that actually do need these animals. But they're sure not walking in our shoes. <laughs> no, they are, they are definitely out there to help the disabled people. And if that means that at your expense sometimes, and sometimes we end up helping people who don't legitimately need it, then that's okay with them. So... Say we have somebody that comes and they have everything signed and everything, and we have a no pet policy. Can we turn them away on that credit? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. In fact, I wouldn't even get to this stage until you know that they're going to be potentially a tenant, right? Background credit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if if you're going to deny them based on financial reasons or credit, let's do that first before we get to this. Put in your application. Do you have a service book? Are you entitled to have a service book? Could, but I would 
I would not advise that. I didn't hear what he said. Can okay. you put in your application, are you entitled to a service and an assistance animal? Oh, okay. <clears throat> I would not put that in there because if they see that, yeah, right, yeah, yeah, like you're screening people right now, it's like, are you black? You know? <laughs> like, I probably wouldn't put that in there. service animal or they suspect that that could lead to a fair housing complaint. What was the question? Can you not renew somebody at the end of the lease? Could it be because the dog has mess? Please. Yeah. So just because we have to allow assistance animals doesn't mean those animals can do whatever the heck they want. If these animals are a nuisance, we can still act within the tenancy to address those nuisances or the damages or anything like that. If the dog becomes overly aggressive, we can evict for that. If, if, say the dog's left at home by himself during the day while someone's at work, and the dog's yapping and annoying yes. a neighbor, what do we do? I would first send them a letter and say, your dog is becoming a nuisance and a disturbance while you're away from the home. You need to address this. Failure to do so may result in legal notices. If they fail to address it, you post a three-day complier, AK. You have not addressed this. If this continues, we may evict you. Would I proceed or niche right away on that first three-day complier vacate? It depends on how much evidence we have to show that this is really a nuisance. But maybe, maybe it kind of stops for a little bit and then starts up again. Right. After your second or third notice, I would probably jump to just a three-day notice to vacate at that point. And, and now we've got a long paper trail saying, this is a habitual nuisance. You have not resolved this. I sent you a warning letter. I've given you a couple three-day complier vacates. It hasn't resolved it. I'm giving you a three-day notice to vacate now. You gotta go. But then they ignore us, and so then we gotta come to you with 400 bucks. That's right. right, that's why I'm giving this seminar. <laughs> <laughs> and then go up there and hope we can get them out of there in 25 days. Yep. Then they yeah. destroy it. Then they get destroyed. Right. What, have you ever run into a case where you got a tenant, they've been approved, move in and so many months later they come out with one of these and one of the dog. Have I ever seen that? So the question is, have I ever seen where a tenant moves in and then you catch them with a companion? No, they, they request the dog. Oh, they request they the dog. They request the dog. After, After they're already After in. they're in. Yes. Oh yeah, is all that, the time. Is that More just, often, is that just as you move them in and they don't have any pets, <laughs> then you catch them with a pet and then they claim it's a companion animal. Yes. That happens yeah, most that's, often. Right, but that's already yes. in order so we probably have a case there. Yes, so here's oftentimes what I advise in that situation. You catch them with an animal. We don't have any reason to believe that maybe they're even disabled or that's a companion animal at this point, right? Right. You're posting a three-day notice, three-day complier vacate for unauthorized animal and potentially post an end of term notice right then as well saying I'm not renewing you at the end of this lease because mm -hmm. even if you comply because you violated my rules. Because then if they come into compliance, you've already posted that end of term notice. Now, if they comply and if everything turns out and they end up being a decent tenant, you can draw that notice during the tenancy. But at least right then, you've already got it. So then if they potentially claim, hey, this is a companion animal and we got to go through, the, through this process of verifying it, well, we've already given them an end of term notice. Then you don't run into that problem where at the end of the tenancy, we're saying, I'm not renewing you. Now it looks like I'm not renewing you because of your service animal. We already gave them that notice. We're not renewing you because you lied to me and you uh, you brought in a non-authorized animal. And, and that was back then. Okay. Kurt, just one quick one. Um, what's the percentage of, if I come to you and we go to court, the judge rules in favor of the tenant on an animal? If you come to me? Yeah, we like less than one percent. <laughs> <laughs> but but that's that's kind of true because I'm not going to file the case unless I know I can get them out. So if it's a companion animal issue, I shouldn't say it's companion. If it's an unauthorized animal issue, I'm not going to file that case unless it's clear that they have violated the lease, or on a nuisance issue, it's clear that this is an ongoing nuisance that they have just failed to remedy. I will file that case. If it's not, I'm going to advise you, 
hey, go post another one of these notices. Let's see how that goes. If they still fail, then we'll file it, or maybe we post another three-day notice. So um, there's great success in this. You just got to make sure you do it right. So contact contact legal counsel when you notice a problem, rather than when it's a crisis and you wanted them out yesterday. You know, I, I, I had a problem like this called up here. And they told me that, hey, if it's an animal, the court is going to go up the tenant. So the Utah Apartment Association does really good. They answer a lot of phone calls. And uh, so you think I had a trainer? They know the laws. No, no. They know the laws, but if you call an, an attorney, is really who you need to talk to if you have a legal issue because, you know, as good as Paul's staff is, I'm in court every day. So I, yeah. I see what the judges will do. My original question was the situation where they moved in and approved. And then they bring the request, mm -hmm. and then they qualify or they comply with all these terms. Are you then required to let them in, or is it already too late? No, you, you've got to let them in. Because wouldn't there have to be some need for them to, to uh, what, demonstrate that they did not have the handicap when they moved in, and now they do? Maybe it wasn't diagnosed? Yeah, well, or even if it was diagnosed, maybe it Maybe it didn't become apparent that they needed this companion animal until sometime during the tenancy. I mean, yeah. I, I'm on board with you guys. Trust me. I think that most of these things. We're letting you be the devil's advocate. I, yes. And that's, you've got to figure out. And that's what I'm here for. But trust me, <clears throat> yeah. I only represent landlords. Yeah. I know that a lot of these are fraudulent. A lot of these are to get animals in without having to pay deposits or rent. Or these are to get animals in where otherwise these animals would not be would not be allowed. But what I'm trying to advise you is one to kind of scare you about fair housing laws because it is real and the the penalties are potentially uh, disastrous for your business. But you have to walk a pretty tight rope. I well, I, yeah, you're exactly right, and so do you guys because HUD is looking for this. The ULRD is looking for this. We're paying their salaries. Yeah, yeah, but they don't have jobs if they don't have findings. Yeah. So they're out looking for this. Well, my question is, as a landlord, and you someone comes in with a service animal, and that animal bites another tenant, you can are we going to be legally liable? Because who's been the first one that's going to be sued? It'll be the landlord. On the animal identification form. been reported to authorities, police animal control for any incident for any reason? If that answer is yes, that's raising a red flag and we may be able to deny it. It's not reasonable anymore if that animal has already demonstrated that it's aggressive or has caused damage but to another person. If they person. put no, if they put yeah, no then, then you know, you know, a little, you know, you've got family that's and, what a, gonna do. Yeah, and yeah. a little kid comes up to pet the dog or whatever, we go he bites, they're not, who are they going to sue? They're not going to sue the, 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 animal lover or the animal, you know, that has the, yeah, you're going to come after the landlord. Well, they're so going to pick you in the protection? deeper pocket. Your deeper protection is this. They affirmed that it didn't. You had no reason to believe that it was a dangerous animal. Is there a way to verify it or to check back through legal records or anything on that subject? There could be, but yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. If they say no, you, you're going to take them at their word, no. But if, it's, if, if, it truly, if it truly has been decided, does the place have like a water or something to go to? I don't know. I don't know. Animal control might be. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't get into calling animal control on every assistance animal request. Well, if it's a bulldog, you would. You'd be able to do something like that. Good. Maybe a bulldog or a Rottweiler or something like that that's more or less infamous for hurting people. Yeah, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't stop the process based on that. Yeah. Based on your ability to phone call. If you want to. If you want to make that phone call to just verify, then that'd be okay. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold your approval of a potential assistance animal based on that. Okay. And you check the apartment more frequently for damage because there's an animal there. Yes, but be careful and discreet about it, right? <laughs> so if. I mean, if you are taking actions against somebody that would be seen as, I don't want to say punitive, but 
is creating more of an obstacle for them in their tendency than you would other people, that might, that might be seen as discrimination. Now, if you've seen that that animal is causing damage, now you're doing it because of damage. Now you have a non-discriminatory reason to inspect that unit more. So maybe we should inspect all units. Yes, and I advise that to my clients so Every all the time. We inspect, inspect a lot. Yes. Um, if someone applies to rent and you've gone through everything, you're just waiting for folks to jump through the hoops to get It's doc, documentation. Mm -hmm. And if you have another applicant that comes along that's fully qualified and it's all set to go, are you obligated to wait for the uh, paperwork to so the documentation? Does everybody hear the question? It's kind of a kind of a tricky situation, but if somebody comes in, if, if you got an applicant that comes in and they end up having a, a request for an assistance animal. Generally, if, if they've... Mass credit, mass background. Yeah, but if... you earn this money, and then tell you this, right? A lot of times, if it's a legitimate request, they're already coming in with this stuff already in hand. They've already got to know from their doctor and all that sort of stuff, so you're going to be able to verify it pretty quick. Right. But if they come and they're not informed or not educated or maybe, maybe abusing the system and trying to get this in, and you give them these forms, you can have a policy that... I approve the first qualified, completed and qualified applicant. If you're requesting an assistance animal and you do not have these back to me, your application is not complete yet. One time we just had a sign out front that said apartment for rent and two groups of people came at the same time and one lady said she had a companion animal and so I said, well, I mean, to, to both parties, I said, we called the previous landlord and the neighbors to find out if you were good to get along with and neighborly, and, you know, that's part of our application fee. Mm -hmm. And she just left. Is that legal to say that I'm going to check on your neighbors to see how you got along with them? Yeah, that's non discriminatory. Okay. You can absolutely do that. And I don't know about neighbor calls all the time, but definitely prior landlord calls. Oh, yeah, we always and do if that. you call the prior landlord and they say, they were okay tenants, that dog trashed my place and that dog happens to be an assistance animal, that's grounds to deny them. Okay. That's just like if they had trashed it themselves. You know? um, can you, how often can you ask for the doctor to give you a prescription for the dog? You have something that's two years old. Is that good? Well, if it's two years old and they're a new applicant, uh -huh. I would probably ask them to get another one. Yeah. But if you've got a tenant that gave it to you at the initial at their lease initiation and they've now been your tenant for three years, I probably would. You don't need to ask for a new one. Well, how about year. after one year? Every year, can you say I need a new verification that the doctor still prescribes it? Probably not. Probably can't not. No. That's crazy. Because right here they're gonna. Right here, they're going to say, anticipated length of this disability is unknown or lifetime days. So, so yeah, it's, it's uh, once a companion animal, once you've approved one, it's probably going to be there as long as the tenancy. Well, do we have any prayer that the Fair Housing will make this any stricter and just go with the service animals, or? You have a prayer that it, our jobs will become more and more difficult. Okay, so, you know, the, the laws, to be fair, are slanted in favor of the protected classes, you know, not, not the landlords. And we do our best by doing stuff like this to try to level the playing field, but for every, for every step we take, they've taken three more steps already, you know. So we're always playing catch up, and it's always going to be more and more difficult, and we're always, you know. Isn't that because they are discriminated against? Way. And so the way they're treated, they, they kind of overshoot, you know, to protect them. So, you know, yeah. there, there are a lot of people out there that are disabled. I know many of them have some in my family that are disabled. And they legitimately are like, oh, okay, it's politically incorrect, but they're nuts if they don't have an animal or something there to pet or calm them down or something, you know, yes. pace for hours or do weird things, you know, 
so if they have something to focus their attention on that stops them from doing these behaviors. And, and so, okay, there are people that, probably a lot of people that abuse the system and take advantage of it, but there are legitimate, legitimately disabled people, and the reason the laws are so ridiculous are because uh, they are discriminating. Yeah, they would rather cast a wider net and know that they're going to get some abusers in there then you know make it easier for us where there's more potential for abuse than there already potentially is so yeah come back to the dog who is home alone and making noises and uh, we gave already two or three notices but what would be needed as a proof just the uh, our our words, so you got the complaints, or it needs to be somebody who testify. No, so in the in the situation earlier, if you've given a warning letter and you've given a complier vacate and maybe another three day complier vacate, and now we're in the eviction stage, your testimony corroborated with the paper trail that you've created over the last several days, weeks, or months, which should be documented with chronologically, man. Times, yeah, kind of it's going to help. But if we're talking about a nuisance of about a companion animal or an assistance animal that went and just bit somebody, we might need the victim or a witness or the victim's family or something like that. Okay, if we're talking about a one-time incident, we're going to need something more than just the notice. Okay. Um, if any of you have seen these forms, you might notice that in prior forms we had a limited HIPAA. HIPAA form, a HIPAA release, so that we could get verification from the doctor. That is no longer necessary. Highlighted right here. Verification does not require the HIPAA form. Why is that? Because we are not asking them to release any medical re records. All we're asking when we call the doctor is for them to just affirm what they've already provided to us, that the person is disabled and that this assistance animal is necessary to treat that disability. So some doctors may still say, I can't release that information. You need to continue to, you need to train them and say, doctor, all I'm asking is that you affirm the information you've already given me. I'm not asking for a release of any records. You've already given me these records. The applicant or the tenant has already given me these records. I'm just affirming this with you, okay? Does the doctor charge for this conversation? Not you. Not charging you. If they try to, that would be an obstacle. And, yeah. and if you can't get the verification from the doctor and you call and you cannot get a hold of them, we can reasonably deny the request until we do get verification. And at that point, after you've made a couple attempts and have been unable to, you need to tell your tenant at that point, I cannot grant this accommodation until I get proper verification. I have tried to get hold of your medical professional and have not been able to and have not received a return phone call. You need to talk to them because until I verify this, your request is going to be denied here. And then they, they can call. So let's talk, let's go back to the verification really quick. So we do want to call them, right? Why? Because one, it may eliminate it just because somebody forged it or it may be their friend or something like that. Let me tell you about an instance when we called and verified one. We call up and it's for a 40 year old lady asking for a companion cat or dog, I don't remember what it was now. The cat. They answer the phone call, Mountain View Pediatrics. Okay, one flag. This is for a four-year-old lady. Why is a pediatric clinic answering? Okay, I'm calling to talk to nurse so-and-so. Another flag, it's a nurse. Okay, so nurse so-and-so gets on. Hey, I'm calling because you filled out a, a verification for a companion animal request, and I just want to talk to you about that. Um, do you treat so-and-so? Yes, really, you treat her at a at a pediatric clinic, why is that? Well, I don't I don't treat her, but I know her, and I know her this way. Okay, I, you know. Eventually it came out, well, she's my next door neighbor, and she told me she needed this without, you know, but she couldn't get her cat in without this. Okay, we can deny that one now. She does not treat her. She, she cannot affirm that there's a nexus between the cat and the disability. But see, that's, that's where money, my sense is, a psychotherapist in LA. He gets this all the time. You know, it's slipping a couple of hundred to do all this. And of course, I'm managing his apartment, so here, so I mean, he knows how that you know, yeah. works, you know. But, but so that's it's, why it's just a game. I mean, you know, and we just don't have any teeth in it. 
you know, so doctors, when you call them, they're prideful. They're going to, they're not going to retract what no, they've already true. said, right? So that's why we train them. Eon. That's why we train them. So if you look on this form, you can kind of, you can basically read them, but. Um, okay, so you, you advise the doctor, say, Okay, I appreciate that you've affirmed this. I just want you to know that I have to make this phone call because start taking the wording from here. Much like a prescription, this, this request is made because in your professional opinion, the animal is necessary to afford this disabled person an equal opportunity to use and enjoy the lease premises. So with this request and approval, I have to allow this animal and I'm prohibited from charging pet rents or fees or actually my community is not even, I don't even allow pets, but because of your affirmation, I now have to do this. It, you know, you don't say it in a derogatory way, of course, mm -hmm. but um, assistance animals, this is not a pet, but in your professional opinion, this is necessary and important part of their treatment for their disability. Okay, yeah. They're gonna say, yeah, but next time they may think, oh man, if they, yeah. if they actually did lie and just signed it because it was put in front of them, they're gonna think, oh man, next time I sign one of these, somebody's gonna call and verify, I'm gonna have to lie about it again if it was abusive, right? So maybe they won't do it. So let me give you a, an example. I, I represent a small community, about 24, there's a 24 flex, I think. And the owners just absolutely do not want any animals there. Well, within a week, they got two companion animal requests for these huge dogs. And both of the companion animal requests were from the same PA. Okay, and this is a pretty tight-knit community. And so the concern was, Oh no, all these other people are going to think they can start getting these animals in exactly. from this same PA. So I called up the PA. It was very difficult to get a hold of because he ran his own clinic on Tuesdays and Fridays from like 3 to 6 p.m. or something like that. Mm -hmm. He was working somewhere else, which, you know, PAs aren't supposed to be able to pre prescribe stuff without the approval of the doctor. But again, this isn't like a FDA type prescription, this is just a permit. 